I believe that we learn what we want to learn within the limits of what we can learn. This almost self-evident idea is very much inspired by Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, while adding a component of will to the already present concept of potential. The old saying goes, when there's a will, there's a way. A cynic would say, if there's a way, bets are you will. I think that learning requires both a will and a way. Many different ways, actually. Neither the want nor the can are static in time. What one wants to learn and what one can learn will grow or shrink over time as one gains experience or forgets, gains access to more or fewer resources, gains or loses confidence, broadens their horizons or withdraws within oneself. The quantity and quality of what one can and wants to learn is also fluctuating over time. This is what I call the axis of mobilization. For example, even if I desperately want to learn to drive, if I'm seven years old, I can't get the necessary permit to do so. At the opposite end of that spectrum, I could be a 40-year-old eco-urbanite that could very well learn to drive, but have no intention of doing so. Of course, as it is quite obvious on the roads, the meeting of want and can is quite frequent. It's especially noticeable at rush hour, though it isn't quite clear that everyone has indeed learned to drive. But that's a whole other story. And then fun and need come into play, or the perception of value axis. Enjoyment can happen when we learn, but can also be the fruit that learning bears. Back to the driving example, learning to drive is seldom enjoyable in itself, but the freedom, the independence, and time savings that driving procures certainly are. So, the way I see it, enjoyment or fun, whether instantaneous or anticipated, is a factor in learning. But, like it or not, there are things that we must learn. This is when our perception of necessity kicks in. Just as it were for what we want to learn and what we can learn, fun and need are not mutually exclusive. We can very well learn something we find useful or necessary while considering this learning or its outcome to be enjoyable. Cooking might be a more elegant example here than driving, but there are people who enjoy driving and make a living of it. As it were for want and can, the scope of what we need or perceive as fun can vary as time goes by. I believe there's a special region where long-lasting, deep-rooted learning happens. It's in the central eye of this diagram. If there's something we want to learn, if it's within our reach, we know we need it and we consider this learning or its outcome to be fun, we will most certainly learn this. The regions just outside of this central eye represent learning that we view as out of reach or of a lower priority, even if this learning might seem enjoyable or useful. There are two borderline zones I find to be of special interest. One where learning might seem useful and fun. We want to learn this, but it seems just out of reach. Perhaps we'll be able to learn this with a little help. The other zone is where we consider ourselves able to learn something we need that appears to be fun, but we simply choose not to learn this at this point. Perhaps we'll eventually accept to learn this, but right now, nah. As for the central eye, this is learning we want to do that seems within our reach, and we consider fun necessary, or better still, both. Okay, now that's out of the way, what do we do about this in schools? Well, I believe that school structure and culture as we know them make it so that only a small fraction of the learning that is expected of students ever falls into their eye. Obviously, if it were any different, we'd be witnessing a lot more spectacular success stories and a lot less dropping out, wouldn't you agree? What are these obstacles that might be hindering school to be the learning catalyst that it could be? Perhaps the following can explain this. Hurdle number one, the classroom and bell model. Learning doesn't necessarily happen at a fixed time, even less so in an environment that is better designed to deal with the constraints of managing important numbers of people, whether they're children, teens, or adults, than it is for its effect on learning. As Dr. John Medina, author of Brain Rules, very aptly put it in his ISTE 2011 opening keynote, the brain seems to be optimized to solve problems related to surviving in an outdoor setting, in unstable meteorological conditions, and to do so in near constant motion. Not exactly what we're offering our learners, right? Instead, school is offering the exact opposite of that, a classroom with a rigid schedule. 
I'm not saying learners should fear for their lives, of course, and this is not what the second brain rule is really about anyway, but we must admit that the rows of desks in a brick-and-mortar school model hasn't been all that successful for a lot of people. Someday real soon, and why not today, we'll have to take a long hard look at the classroom and bell structure and think of something completely different, from the ground up. Or how about starting from the brain up? A classroom and a bell were necessary to have enough people at the same time to benefit from the presence of a teacher. And that's still important, of course, but why should it be the only model? Hey, I'm not saying I know exactly what a new brain-friendly school should look like, but I do think that the differentiation potential that technology offers is most likely part of its architecture. For cooperation, for accessing information and references, for gathering data, for simulations, for creativity, technology, mobile or otherwise, is amazing and you can keep in contact with a teacher or many peers and experts at the same time. And that goes for evaluation as well as learning, in my opinion. Outside the box, you say? Well, outside the classroom walls, why not? Hurdle number two, the assembly line paradigm. As Sir Ken Robinson said with much eloquence and brilliant humor in his 2008 address to the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, the best we came up with in order to group learners in a classroom in this industrial model of school that we have is by date of manufacture, their age. Different learners will have different interests, strengths and challenges. And now instead of truly nurturing that, school tends to standardize. Funny thing, just imagine what teachers would say if trainers were to group them by age or years of experience in a workshop. Yeah, that would go well. Bottom line, physical aptitudes aside, age has little to do with the want, can, fun and need for learning any given subject. So why is it so hard for us to offer true differentiation for learners of any age? I think it's safe to say that the one-size-fits-all classroom lecture is outdated considering all we know about the brain, learning and creativity. In essence, that type of lecture is oblivious to what learners want and can learn at that specific moment in time. We work hard at convincing the audience they need to learn this thing we're talking about and hopefully we also work hard at making the experience enjoyable. But wouldn't it be wonderful if a learner could access good, engaging lectures when they need them, want them, and are ready for them? I think the flipped classroom model is very promising in that respect. The Aaron Sams and Jonathan Bergman flipped classroom, or Salman Khan's Khan Academy, and now Ted Ed, all let learners use online video to access or review concepts, notions, and processes. This leaves more class time for the teacher to engage their students in other types of learning activities. Might as well let the computer take care of the computable and let the teacher take better care of the meaningful. I think this is also true of pedagogical consultancy. You can watch this video and other professional development oriented material as often as you want, when you consider it relevant for you, and wherever it suits you. Perhaps this is exactly the kind of freedom the brain needs to truly learn. Hurdle number three, acne. Acne is a big problem in education. No, 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 not the zits. I'm talking about learning or teaching activities that are cognitively non-engaging. I believe we're still stuck with too many of these classic school book activities and assignments that don't really bring much to the learning table. A classroom with too much acne is like a potluck dinner where everybody's bringing a bag of chips. Where's the beef? or chicken, or tofu, or whatever your protein of predilection is. It's as if we were afraid to offer learning tasks and activities that are open enough to be challenging, with enough complexity to be authentic, and would allow for a variety of outputs so they could be relevant. We haven't quite rid ourselves of the correct answer syndrome. The program content is somewhat antiquated. For instance, we're still teaching to compute some things by hand that no one ever does outside of a school. And the exams are not yet in step with a true competency-based approach to learning. So we still give way too much importance to bottom of blooms type of activities, the rote learning, the following of recipes, and the answering of trivia style quizzes. Now I'm not saying there's no room at all for this type of activity in the learning process, but perhaps they are given a little bit too much space. On a side note, Dan Mayer explains how you can turn existing formulaic math problems into more relevant and engaging learning activities. I loved his eye-opening lecture on TED Talks. 
Technology can have two roles here. First of all, if there's a need for memorizing, basic understanding, and formulaic application of techniques for anything that has to do with the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, well, the computer's really good at helping learners with that. And it can also give instant feedback, which makes it kind of hard to beat. Secondly, and this is where it gets really interesting in my view, is that technology helps us to push top of Bloom's learning, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, into the center eye from the fun and can perspectives. With the right software, and most of it is very affordable or even free, the realm of the possible is now bigger, much bigger. With a few clicks, we can change the type of diagram used to convey information after analyzing data, so you don't need to draw every possible chart to evaluate which one is best suited for this context or the other. This allows you to focus on how information is conveyed differently when playing with scale and the type of graphic or chart. Careful now. It's easy to get lost in some of these project-type activities and lose track of what actually is in the program. If you're engaging your learners in editing video, for instance, it's easy to invest way too many hours and thus steer away from the actual intended learning. Technology integration is not the goal. It is the means to an end. It's wonderful that a student can learn to use SlideRocket or PowerPoint or some other presentation software, but what I'm really looking for is an opportunity for them to work on their communication competencies and develop their language skills. The presentation software helps from the can and fun perspectives, but technology is not what we're learning. It does influence how we're learning. In a nutshell, here's how I see learning today, because hopefully that view is always evolving. These people, and others of course, have influenced how I see learning. I think that people learn what falls in this middle eye at the intersection of want, can, fun, and need. They can also learn stuff that falls outside of it, though it might be more easily forgotten or eventually dismissed, like one would after a brain cramming exam. A good teacher can have an impact on all of these to help make learning more challenging, relevant, and engaging. We should seriously reconsider this, and it's really up to us to get rid of that. Technology, whether schools allow learners to bring their own or make it accessible to their learners, is really good at taking care of this and can help to aim higher here. Now, how do you see learning? Go ahead and share it.